Welcome everybody. My name's Christine Krein. I'm one of two master trainers that Camera has. I tend to train a lot on beer for Camera, but I also train for breweries, for pubs, including Weatherspoons. My background was very much in the food industry and I've been active in Camera for many years. I was the first female to run the Greenwich Beer Festival and I've been on the Camera National Executive twice. So that's my, my, um, if you like, my background. What we're gonna do today is we're going to be looking at Camera's new beer styles to get you to understand why we have beer styles in the first place and then to taste five different beers and be able to distinguish what different styles they are and put them into the new style categories. So the whole purpose of this session is to get you to understand uh, about these new beer styles, which is quite a change from where we currently are. And so let me just explain to you a little bit about what we're going to do, okay? So to start with, what I'd like you to think about is whether or not you've got some of these, these, these tips. So think about these tips before you start. Chill the beers and have them available, all there. The tasting is best done at one sitting. By all means, it can be more than one of you. Sometimes it's good fun to do it if, if there's more than one of you. So you can discuss the beers as we go through. Try and have a fresh glass, ideally halves or wine glasses, not pints, far too big for each of the five beers. Have a glass of water handy to clean your palate between each beer as we go through it. And this should take about 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how fast you drink. Okay? So before you start, you need the following. You need five beers. You need a lager to start with. All of these beers, with the exception of the last, which I'll explain in a minute, um, are readily available from supermarkets. So you can have Camden Hells, Star of Praman, Budweiser, Budvar, or Pilsner Quell, all good examples of lagers or Hell's beers, which are available from the local supermarket. Then we're going to go on to do Timothy Taylor's Landlord, then St. Ostor's Proper Job, then we're going to do Witchwood Hobgoblin Ruby. Please make sure you get the ruby and not the gold or the IPA, because it won't fit for what we're going to be talking about. And last but not least, you can pick any quarter or stout, use a local brewery if you like, Make sure it's not flavoured. So make sure you've, it's not got added chocolate or added coffee because that will defeat what we're going to be talking around. If you are struggling to know what to get, some examples, some good examples, maybe a couple of beers from Fuller's, either their London Porter or their Black Cab, or you can think about one of the Guinness beers, either their West Indian Porter, quite a big kick at 6%, or their Nigerian Guinness. Both of those are good examples of the style and if you can't think, if you can't get something from your local brewery. You also need and download, ideally print or have them available on another computer, for the three handouts. A template which you can fill in as you go through the beers, the flow chart on determining the beer styles, and the beer styles leaflet. And this is much easier to use than when we're discussing the styles rather than using the four style sheets where, that camera, uh, cameras tasting panels use. Cameras tasting panels are groups of people around the country who are responsible for doing the beer descriptions for the Good Beer Guide and for, and for putting beers forward for the Champion Beer of Britain. And they have a much more detailed uh, set of notes. But you don't necessarily need that for this session. This is a bit easier. So once you've got all of these together, then we'll start the session. If you haven't, stop the video now and uh, go back and get together and come and join me once you've got that. Okay. Well, welcome back. If you haven't, if you've been away and come back, just to think about what the, the beer styles and cameras champion beer Britain. We believe it's the longest running consumer organisation. Uh, organization who run beer, uh, beer competition in the world so the longest consumer uh, consumer beer award lots of technical ones been some which dating back to the 1800s but we believe we're the longest it's been going since 1978 and usually run at cameras uh, great british beer great british beer festival in the summer Cameras National Executive uh, have been noticing the changes in beer styles over the last few years, phenomenally different. And I'll come on to explain a bit more about what's been happening in the market. So they decided that we should really have a good review. And in 2019, they set up a review group, which I chaired, and it was made of brewers, 
camera members. It was made up of uh, people who were involved with beer writing, beer publishers. And the whole purpose of the review was not just to look at what beers we've got now, but to think about the trends in what's happening in the beer market and what's likely to happen in the future. So today what we're going to be covering is the, uh, the different beer styles. We're going to be tasting five different beers, we're going to be asking you to put those beers into different styles uh, and be using the flow charts, the leaflet and the template as we go through. So make sure you've got stuff all in front of you, ready to go, and then we'll get going. Now there are two reasons why we have beer styles. The, the reason for that is it's twofold. It's to help the drinker make an informed decision. When you go to the bar, having something which says a bitter or gold nail or a stout or a porter, will give you an idea of what that beer is gonna taste like. So it's really helpful. And most people have ideas of roughly about what those beer styles are. But it also makes it easier for us to be able to judge beers. If you're judging bitters against bitters, it's much easier than judging a bitter against a stout. It's much easier than say, if you're judging all porters together, uh, uh, then you are against a judging porter against a gold nail. So it makes us much easier, it much, much easier for a beer judge to make a decision on what's a good beer. So what we've tried to do with this is to group beers together so that we're judging in categories of similar and like beers. Currently, we have 10 different beer styles, uh, sorry, beer categories. And in those beer categories, there are different beer styles which we've put together. Um, roundabouts were 13 to 15 different beer styles have been defined in those 10 categories. We are moving to 12 different beer categories based on what's been happening in the market. And we're defining over 30 different beer styles now. So those beer styles are put into those 12 different categories. In an ideal world, we'd be having a lot, lot more different categories, but it's limited by two factors. One is in certain categories, there's a limited number of beers that are of that particular beer style. So it's, if you're doing it, you're judging something, there aren't that many beers in a particular area. And the second is limited by the number of, of beer festivals that can host the, the competitions. And the reason for this is that to start with, how a beer gets put forward is it gets poured by, by two routes. The tasting panels, which I've mentioned before, and also members votes. And those are split into nine different regions. So what happens uh, is that in, in those nine regions, each of those beer style categories are judged and they have to be judged at a beer festival. There is a limited number to the beer festival that actually host it. And then the winners in each of those nine regions go forward to be judged at the national. So let's have a look at where we are now in terms of the new beer styles. So you can see in each of those nine regions, we need 12 beer festivals to be able to judge those, those different categories. And we look at some of these styles and we know that there aren't many beers in that particular style category. A good example is barley wines. There aren't that many draft barley wines that are being produced. Most of these days tend to be bottled rather than draft. So we've combined them, combined them with, gold, uh, with uh, strong ales. And they can be golden strong ales, blondes effectively, or they can be dark. And we put those together in category. The same could also be true with milds. We know from something called our brewery information system, which I'll explain in a minute, that there aren't that many milds out there. There's only four, about 400 and odd that are produced regularly. But we've decided to keep this category because we feel quite strongly that if camera doesn't campaign for mild, nobody else will. The brewery information system that I've just mentioned uh, is a huge database of of many beers that are produced in the UK on a regular basis that we have, which are cask beers. It does include some cakes as well, but it mainly is biased towards cask. And they get there by the additions of people like the tasting panels, writing up those notes to go onto that system, and also for something called the brewery liaison officers. Brewery liaison officers are the liaison between camera and a particular brewery, and they put information on there too. So you can see we now have these 12 categories and what we're going to do today is to go through a lot of these categories and to give you some explanation as to why we've done these 12 
rather than another different twirl. So, okay, what I'd like you to do now is to get your first beer sorted, which is your lager. I'm using a Camden Hells, uh, which is a, a cross between a, 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 pe a Czech Pilsner and a he Helles beer. And Helles beer is of like a Bavarian version. But let me show you to start with what we do. You don't pour all of the beer in. You're needing to be leaving a reasonable gap at the top uh, so that you can get your nose in. So when we look at a beer, the first thing to do is to swirl it around. This is a, a keg beer, lots of carbonation, which is all those bubbles. If it's a bottle conditioned beer, the bubbles are coming naturally. But this is a this is a keg beer, so it's been artificially carbonated. With this style of beer, which is a lager, I'm looking for a reasonable head. I'm looking for a clear beer, although a lot of some some beers these days particularly are hazy. But if I'm judging the beer, I need to know whether it's hazy or not. Then what I do is stick my nose in. The, and what you should be picking up here is the bready or, or sometimes biscuity and usually a bit of fruit. The, these style of beers tend to use what they call no, noble hops. If you've got a Czech lager, the likelihood of Czech pills, now the likelihood is it's using a Tsar's hops, which is an Eastern European hop. With Germans, uh, Pilsners, it can be wide, it can be something like Tanang, there's about four different hops it could use, which includes Tsar's as well. But you're looking for something with toasted biscuits, maybe um, some, some fruit on the nose, usually lemon for me, I'm getting, and then put the beer in your mouth. Make sure it goes all the way around. Your taste buds are all over your palate, but at the back of your palate, you've got more taste buds on bitterness. Your palate actually only picks up four flavours, and that is sweetness, sourness, saltiness, and bitter. All the rest of those flavours you're picking up is due to olfactory glands, which are at the back of your nose, which explains why you can't taste when you've got a cold. So when you see a tea blender and wine blender gargle, it's to get the liquid across the back of the palate to really get the bitterness, but also it's to get the, the, the aromas up across the back of the tongue and up into your nose. So they're getting a real impact of that particular beer. So when we're looking at the different style of lagers, if you go into, into this leaflet, which you should pull out, you can find that on page 10, you'll see we've done some descriptions of the different types of lagers. Uh, what we've got here, and it says the German and Czech style Pilsners, which is what it, most of you I'm sure will have. Uh, the Czech lagers tend to be crisp, uh, spicy. Uh, sometimes you get a little bit butterscotch, but not always. Whereas the German pills tend to be sort of lighter, crisper, drier, often more bitter and lingering and a little bit of mortiness. With Hells, with, and this is, as I said, this particular beer is a sort of halfway hybrid. It's a, Bel, uh, it's a, Bel, it's a Bavarian style beer, um, often called Munich Hells beer, lagers, uh, and it's a cross between the Czech and effectively a, a German beer. Hells just simply means German, it, it means bright in German. So that's what you're looking for in these particular beers. So go through it, make sure you're getting the beer across your, your palate, and by all means, use the template that we provided with you to write your own notes. Okay. Just want to explain why we've ended up with these categories. You can see from the brochure that we've divided the beers in speciality now into two. Originally, we only had one beer uh, category, which was speciality. Now we've got speciality differently produced. And if you turn to the back page of the brochure, you can see we've got speciality flavoured. So what I'd like you to do is pick up the flow charts. So pause if you haven't got them to your hand and make sure you've got them there. And you will see that they're divided into two. So let's start with what we're drinking now, which is effectively into the speciality beer differently produced category. So we're starting with the first, the, the, middle, co the middle column, and this bit lagers sit in with different yeasts. Lagers are bottom fermented yeast. So that means they sit on the bottom when the fermentation takes place and they ferment at a lower temperature. Now bear in mind that there are some, some owl yeast now that will ferment at the bottom, but they still are owl yeast, so they're not a speciality. In this category, we've also got things like, uh, like Saison, Belgium yeast. 
they give you often funky sort of flavours. Saison's for me is always farmyardy, which is a Belgian, northern, a sort of French style, which you'll get around that sort of region. You get quite a lot from that. Then you end up with things like wild yeast. Uh, Brettomyces is, is what people might, might uh, have heard of. Brett, Brett yeast is, is, is abbreviation. And those are from wild yeast. You can add artificial yeast now to it. You can buy packets of, of wild yeast, of Brettomyces. But sometimes, like traditional uh, uh, lambics and gers in Belgium, it's just left open to the atmosphere and allowing those, those, uh, the yeast that are in the air to come and, and ferment the beer. So what the characteristics you get there are quite acidic. So when you think also too of the sorts of characteristics you get with the girls and the lambics, that's a sort of characteristic acidic, very farmyardy, almost like ciders. You often hear it being called as wild yeasts and that's, that's in that category. But if you end up with a sour beer, it doesn't necessarily mean to say it's due to the yeast. Sometimes it can be due to uh, uh, bacteria. In this particular case, if you go on to other ingredients processes, you can see we're mentioning something called lactobacilli here. And that's when you, you get these sort of uh, characteristics, again, of sourness, and it's due to the bacteria. Can be created by adding yogurt. Sorts of beers that use that are things like Berliner Weiss, and you may have heard of Gosa, which is a German style, and they use this sort of beer as well. We've also included this in this thing, another area, which is wood, wood aged beers. Huge area of growth in comparison. So it's beer that's been put in barrels of some sort, whiskey barrels, sherry barrels, wine barrels. And what happens is the beer gets that sort of characteristic of woody notes, uh, all sorts of complexity from the barrel itself. Then if we took the first column, we've got something here called different grains. Now here we're talking about beers that are made with something other than malt. Can be 100% something else, or it can be malt and something else. So things like oatmeal. We find in these days that a lot of bitter uh, American style IPAs may have oatmeal in them. And the reason for that is to soften down the characteristics of the really big bitter character you're getting from the hops. That then is classified as an adjunct. So it's not adding to the flavour, it's just adding to the mouthfeel and it's helping the drinkability. And if you get that, it will sit in the IPA category rather than speciality. So you're looking here really about things like wheat beers, often cloudy, not the clear ones like we've got here. That's, that sits quite clearly in here. But you can get wheat that's added to a beer just for head retention. And again, that's uh, classified as an adjunct doesn't add to the taste. Then you've got rye beers, used a lot in red beers. And again, if it's only a little bit of, of, of rye, then we allow it to stay, sit in whatever category it comes into. But these are big, bold rye beers where you're getting the lemony tart sort of character coming through from, from that particular grain. Then you get spelt. Spelt is not a big area for the UK, but you can get some. It used to be used quite a lot for beer productions back in the oh, Middle Ages and so, uh, but not so much these days. And then you've got smoke warts, things like uh, where you've had the more peaty character you can often get. Uh, you can get things like that. You know, route beers, the German style route beers fit into this category. But the last bit is just an explanation about gluten free. If you go back about 20 years, the gluten-free beers used to use different, different grains. Things like sorghum was a, was a big one. These days you can get gluten-free beers that are not using anything else but malt, but either it's been fermented out, you get a lot of lagers that are, that are gluten-free where the gluten's been fermented out, or you end up using malt where it's been affected by the enzymes, it's been treated by enzymes. So you can get bitter, ordinary bitters using malt where the enzymes has, has reduced and effectively reduced, almost, not quite to zero, but very low gluten levels. And if the, the, you end up with a beer like that, it would sit, say it's a bitter, it would sit in the bitter category rather than speciality. So you can see the complexity already just within those different, uh, those different uh, headings. And this is one of the reasons why we wanted to, to divide the two. So if we go on to the next one, which we're calling uh, uh, flavoured, and the definitions on that, you can see a lot of the, uh, information on the back page of the brochure. 
and we split it into two just for ease one of which is fruit so it could be raspberries uh, cherries you get a lot of Belgian beers, things like Framboise and Creek, Creek, which is the black, the cherry beers, into this category. Yes, they've got an acidic character, but because it's fruit led and the acidity, because it's using wild yeast, is secondary, they sit still in the fruit beer category. You also get things in here like orange, you can get orange added to this, you can get uh, grapefruit, you can get all sorts of different fruits in this one. Older flowers fit into this uh, added beer, uh, adds a flavoured beer category as well. But there is one thing to bear in mind, is just because a beer tastes of grapefruit or lemon, it may not have had those ingredients added. Those flavours may be coming from, from the hops. So for example, uh, a lemon beer may be, that lemon character may be coming from the American hop called Citra. Or if it's grapefruit, it may be coming from an American hop called Cascade. And if that's the case, it will sit in whatever category it is. Usually it's things like IPAs or, or gold nails, but it may be different, but it's not a speciality because the flavours are coming from the hops. So nothing added. Then we're moving across to things like the herbs and spices. And here you're looking at things like uh, coriander and orange peel, traditionally used in things like uh, Belgian wheat beers. But coriander has been used in the UK uh, for flavouring beers for hundreds and hundreds of years. You can get things like all sorts of other berries in it. You, get, you can get uh, spices, red peppers, black peppers. But again, bear in mind that just because you get a peppery note, that peppery note may not be due to added peppers. It may be peppery coming from the hops. So you do need to be careful on this, but you can get things like tea. Uh, bergamot is classic with the, the old grey tea. That's a really big one at the moment. But you can get uh, clearly ginger, big, big uh, flavour ingredient. But also you can get things like chilli, garlic, all sorts of things which come into this. There are some stout beers uh, that use lactose. If it's a, a stout, it comes into the stout categories and we'll explain the categories uh, uh, in due course uh, when it's talking about stouts and porters. But sometimes too, a bit like we were talking in the oatmeal, we can find some beers, beers that are adding uh, lactose so that we end up with a bit of better mouthfeel. So you, so it's an adjunct again, rather than a flavour. So you do need to be careful about thinking about where those beers sit. Okay, so that's a whirlwind bit about speciality. So get yourself suit, sorted and what we're going to do is we're going to go on to the next beer. Now make sure you have a clean glass and the beer we're going to do now is Timothy Taylor's Landlord. Very traditional, this beer. It's been around a long while. Uh, this is a 4.1% beer. Interestingly, the draft version is stronger. So again, pour it out. Have a good look at it. That's that colour. And so what we're looking to do with this beer is we're, getting, we're going to try and work out what the beer style is. The reason why I said it's interesting it's only 4.1 is that again this is this is not a bottle conditioned beer it's a keg beer and so this getting those bubbles there but normally speaking a brewer will often have their bottle beers stronger than their draft beers and that's because the carbon dioxide makes the beer drink lighter so in this particular case the the draft version is stronger than the bottle version but normally it's the other way around things like london pride for example the bottle version is 4.7 whereas the uh, the draft the draft version is a lot lighter so it really does depend on the beer so what we're looking at now is again look at the beer look at the color of it give it a good sniff then give it put the beer in your mouth and give it a good swirl around Look at that and then think about the aftertaste. Now, where we are looking in terms of the beer characteristics, we are looking at this beer. You can see from the colour, it's an amber beer. It's not, too, it's not too dark, it's not too light, but it's an amber beer. And so you're looking at the flow charts on page two, which is straw to amber beers. And we know from the, from the alcohol content, a look at this we're saying okay where's it going to be it's going to fit either in the in the session bitter and you can find the descriptions there on page two on page four of the leaflet 
or it's going to be a session pale because this, these categories go up to 4.3% in both cases. Uh, I'll explain why we split them that way in due course. So what we're going to ask you to do is to think about which category this beer sits in. Is it a session pale or is it a session bitter? And this particular thing may actually help. So we've spoken about that, so bear with me. Okay, now, when we're looking at amber beers, they can either be a bitter. So when we're looking at a bitter beer, when we're looking at traditional bitters, you're looking at some malt, some hops with some fruit. With the pale ales, we're looking at more, less malt. We're looking at the fruits and then the hops. There will be some hops there, but generally speaking, it's a sort of halfway between what we're talking about, the gold nails and the ambers. So it's more, it's, it's got a little bit usually more fruity character than, than the traditional bitters. So on the cold categories, there we split them into two. We split them into a gold ales that are not very fruity, which we're calling blondes. And, uh, and then we're talking about fruity gold, nail, gold beers, which we're calling gold nails. And that's the same as our categories we've got now. So looking at this, what I'd like you to do is to think about it and tell me which way you think it sits. So it's an amber beer. Is it a bitter or is it a pale ale? So think about it. And then when you're ready. OK, well, welcome back. If you go back and look at the what we're talking about, you, you've got 50, 50 percent chance of, of getting it right. So let's go back and look at the screen. Bear in mind, look at that colour. Yeah. If you look at that colour and look at the descriptions we've got in terms of what a, uh, an amber beer is, if you look at the flow charts, we're looking at something that's going to have a little bit of, of malt character. When you read it, it's saying it should have a malt character that's noticeable hops, typically earthy, spicy and peppery. So we're looking here at a, at a bitter rather than a pale ale. The reason for it is with a pale ale, if you read the description, we're looking for the, the malt to be light in character, some hot character, but we're also looking for a bit more fruitiness, whereas the, on, the, on the bitters, the fruit is, is less there. If I now tell you that the, this particular beer, which is the landlord, is using two uh, uh, hops, one is Styrian Goldings, which is an Eastern European hop, and the other one is a traditional Goldings and Fuggles, sorry, three hops, I beg your pardon, it's using a traditional, it's using Fuggles and Goldings, both of which are British hops. You can see it's definitely a traditional uh, bitter. Traditional bitter is where the, this beer currently sits in, in cameras, definitions of beer styles, and we're not proposing to, to move it. We think it sits really well there. What's happening, if you look at the bottle, which is, can be misleading, it says it's a pale ale. Now, pale, traditionally, pales were very, very popular in Britain in the 1950s. This is a beer that, that dates back to that sort of area, but it is a traditional British type pale ale and the market's moved on. And a lot of the pale ales we now have within, the, uh, within Britain are more American style, they're much more fruitier, which brings me on to explaining why we've ended up doing what we've done in terms of this new category of pale blondes and gold nails. The reason for it is that we were finding lots of beers, about a third of the beers that were out there, which of this sort of color, were not a gold nail. They were too, they were too malty, so too dark in color, more malty character to be a gold nail. Gold nails are basic pale in colour, very, very little malt, maybe some biscuit, but very, very little malt. Um, so that so these pale beers weren't, weren't sitting in that category, but they're not a traditional bitter. So they were less malty than a traditional bit bitter and more fruity, so more dominant than fruit, which is why I was saying that pales are generally halfway between a pale and a golden and a gold nail. We also had a problem um, where the, we were finding that there were beers that were golden in colour, but they weren't very fruity. And we've had a few beers around from the eight, 1980s, uh, such as Exmoor Gold and Hotback Summer Lightning, which are gold nails, um, but they're not very fruity. So 
and we want our gold nails these days for, for camera in terms of these definitions to be really, really fruity. And they weren't. So we they were going into the gold nail categories and they weren't winning anything because they were too they were weren't fruity enough. They were we were putting them into the bitter categories, which is where they sit at the moment, they're strong bitters, and they don't have enough malt, so they're not winning anything either. So we combine these three areas together, power blondes and gold nails, to we try and get across the problems we were having of this big catchment of beers that weren't a bitter and they weren't a gold nail. So we've brought these two together. You can see that we've divided them from 4.3% and below, pales, blondes and gold nails, and 4.4% and above. And it's also the case with the bitters. And all we've done, and uh, it's it shows you the, the use of our, of our brewery information system, this big database, is we've divided them into two. So we now have, from the numbers of beers on, on our database, we have half the beers that are bitters of 4.3% and below, and half the beers that are called bitters of 4.4% above, and ditto exactly the same with the pale blondes and gold nails. It was simply done in terms of the number of beers in those categories. When we're thinking about the gold nails, a good example of a gold nail to get in your mind is something like perhaps Oakham Citra, where it's a single lemony hop, well, dominantly, there is another hop in there, I believe now, and that gives you the sort of characteristic fruit lead, very little malt. You, you've got in those sorts of characteristics of things like the bitters, London Pride, um, uh, Marston's uh, pedigree, all these sort of traditional uh, malty beers uh, are off on the side, but said we're getting this big growth of beers that are called a pale ale. Do bear in mind that what it says on the tin, so to speak, label or whatever, is not necessarily how camera will describe those beer styles. The, uh, one of the biggest growth of beer styles has been the growth of pale ales in, for in certainly there is very few so-called craft breweries that don't have a pale ale, but a lot of those pale ales are really, really fruity, very little warp, so they're really a gold nail rather than a pale ale. Again, this is one of the reasons for, for getting this category, so we can encompass those. And we will find a lot of the session IPAs, which is the next beer we're going to be doing, well, an IPA, not a session IPA. The session IPAs will sit into this pale category. But we're looking for gold nails again, still being really fruity, and the pale ales being somewhere between the bit more fruit than a bitter, uh, bit more going, a bit more going on in terms of the malt than, than a, a gold nail. And these blondes, very little malt, but generally speaking, maybe using uh, European hops and British hops, which are giving you somewhere which is not sitting, certainly not sitting in the gold nail categories. Okay, right. Yeah, okay with that, finish your beer off, and we'll get yourself sorted out for the next beer, which is an Ostor's tribute, and we'll start again. Well, welcome back. We're now doing St. Ostor's proper job, and as you can see, it's calling itself a Cornish IPA. Perfect fine. And it's 5.5%. You can find the definitions of this on page six of the of the leaflet which will give you the different uh, the different styles within it the reason for introducing this category was because the review groups have been seeing a huge growth in number of beers of calling themselves ipa many of them aren't things like drinking ipa is only mid threes it's not a proper ipa when and we would think about a proper British IPA, any IPA, we're thinking about a beer that's strong. It had to be strong to be able to cope with the fact it was, it had to be transported for, for long periods of time. So the alcohol content helped keep it, uh, keep it intact, so keep the, help the keepability. And we're looking for a beer that's hoppy. Said that, so we're looking at beers here only of 5.5% and above. As I mentioned before, if they're below 5.5% and above, but they've got these sort of characteristics, they will sit into the pale ale, blondes, and gold nail categories. And a lot of those session IPAs are definitely gold nails. They're not hoppy enough to be a traditional bitter, uh, a traditional IPA anyway. So again, pour it out. Let me open up. This is a bottle conditioned beer. 
all of the bubbles that are coming from this are due to the yeast eating the sugars that are in the beer and then uh, and then fermenting and giving carbon dioxide as a byproduct. My beer is a little bit hazy. I've just knocked it. Um, you won't get a lot of, of yeast in this, but when you finish a bottle, if you put some water in the bottom uh, in the bottle itself, give it a swirl around and then pour it out, you'll see you'll get haziness, which is due to the the yeast that's sitting in the bottom, which is still carrying on fermenting. So this beer, when you smell it. You should be getting a lot of fruit on the nose yeah which is and what we're looking at in terms of this color it's quite pale and i'm going to explain now the differences between a british ipa and a new world ipa i should also add that black ipas also sit in this category but those are a bit easier to spot but we're going to have a look today about the differences between the two types of ipa so here we go right British IPA. Okay, well, British IPAs, and in both British and New World IPAs, you're looking for beers that are heavily hopped. With a British IPA, you're looking for some malt being there, medium to high bitterness, often honey biscuit malt aromas and flavours, pepper, spicy, earthy, piney, or floral resins, typical of British hops. They give you those sorts of characteristics. And the fruit, if evident, should not have the citrus kick of New World IPAs. It should be more subtle. You have to get apricots, uh, oranges, uh, peaches, that sort of characteristic. The soft stone fruit in a British IPA rather than an American IPA. So New World IPAs, which are both New Zealand, anywhere, uh, New Zealand and, uh, and American IPAs. Again, very much hop forward. We're looking at malt making a less of an impact than traditional British versions. You're looking for malt being there, but not dominant. So only a little bit with hops and fruit, much more complex than the premium pale ales and blondes, much more hops. So the malt should only just be a little bit there. Uh, but if it is there, generally biscuity, not the sort of dark characteristics, the nutty sort of characteristics you get from something called a crystal malt. Crystal malts are, gen uh, are darker roast malts and they often give you biscuity sort of toffee sort of characters and that certainly shouldn't be present in a new world ipa and they can have fruit akin to new world uh, gold nails and are noticeably fruitier than british ipas but bear in mind there are some beers that sit halfway between a new world ipa and a british ipa west some west coast ipas can be slightly mortier slightly darker and particularly what they call new england ipas they can have a little bit more malt um, sort of slightly certainly paler than a traditional british ipa um, but certainly with a little bit more malt than a new world ipa to give you an idea of a, of a british ipa if you put it in your mind it's things like worthington white shield and things like uh, marston's old empire both of those have got the classic uh, characteristics of ipas so what I'd like you to do, those are the definitions, using the def reading the descriptions in the leaflet, decide on whether you think that beer, this one we've got here, is it a British or is it a New World IPA? So have a taste of it, use your characteristics on the template that we spoke about earlier, yeah, to try and pull apart that beer and use the, uh, the descriptions in the brochure to decide on whether or not which one you think it is. So when you've done, restart me and we'll get going again. Well, welcome back. This particular beer is a New World IPA. When we've done this before, people get a bit confused. The reason is, is this is a beer that's been around a while. It was a part of a new wave of people trying IPAs in the UK. Uh, St. Austell's, which of course is down in Cornwall. And this particular beer has got quite a lot of biscuity character, which is coming from the Marisotta hop, uh, Marisotta malt. And that gives you a sort of a biscuity sort of character. That can be a bit confusing. But the three hops it's using are all American. And they're Willamette, Cascade and Chinook. So this is definitely a New World IPA. So when you smell it, you should be picking up grapefruit. And often a little bit of lemon on the nose as well as that biscuit flavor when you put it in your mouth you should be picking up those american style those american style hops 
Yeah. Now you get that real fruitiness. If I compare that against a Worthington White Shield, that characteristic is totally different. You're getting hops, you're, uh, but the hop and the fruity character is very much more apricotty, orangey. And there's a different type of maltiness that's coming through very much more in terms of slightly nutty, whereas this particular beer is cleaner, biscuity, but very much lighter. OK, so that's that particular beer. Right. So when you're ready, think about taste it again. Make sure you've got your head around this. We'll, we'll stop, get the next beer sorted. Make sure this time you have a really good uh, gulp of water. This bitterness has been building up and Landlord too has got a bit bitterness. So make sure you get that water, clean your palate well. Have a have something like a, 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 a digest, no, not digest biscuit, a water biscuit or something like that if you want to, to clean your palate. Once you've got rid of that, that bitterness, come back and join me again and we're going to do the hop, Hobgoblin uh, Ruby. OK, welcome back. So again, make sure you don't pour huge amounts in it. And you can notice automatically that the colour of this is completely different. This is another keg bottle beer. The, the colour is so much darker and that's due to all the dark, different dark malts, more roasted malts that they're using in this. Now, with this particular beer, we're going to ask you two questions. And the first question is quite a simple one. We're going to ask you to have a look at the descriptions of what a premium um, bitter is, which you'll see on page five, and a brown owls, red owls, old owls, and strong owls, which you'll find on page seven of the leaflet. Okay. It may also help you if you take the flow chart. And you'll see that there's a flow chart which says red and brown beers. And you can use that to try and help your way through it. But to start with, all I want you to do is to taste this beer. And it's 5.2%, it's so it's definitely in the premium category. Do you think this beer is a bitter? So is it premium bitter? Or should it sit in the, in the, uh, in the red ales, uh, brown ales, uh, old ales and the strong miles category? Look at the descriptions, put your head around what you've got, and then once you've made your decision, come back and we'll talk about it. So is it category three or is it category seven that this beer should be judged in? Bearing in mind there's different styles, which, which category should it sit in, three or seven? And then when you've had a guess, come back and we'll have a talk. Don't drink all the beers because I've got a secondary question for you. All right, okay. This is not a premium bitter. If you read the description, it says quite categorically, medium to strong malt flavor, which it has, but it's got noticeably hops. This isn't noticeably hoppy. It's very malty on the nose, fruit rather than any hop characteristic. When you put it in your mouth, you're getting esters there, the sort of, the, the sort of pear, the sort of characteristics of and almost a, a darky sort of chocolatey almost type of malts there. This isn't a premium bitter. Interestingly, this currently sits in the uh, in the bitter categories, in the strong bitter categories, because we've gone from having three bitter categories, which is bitter, uh, best bitter and strong bitter, to just two, which is the premium and, uh, and the session bitters. This doesn't fit there far, far too malty. And it, if I judge this against the other bitters there, if you compare this, say something like a uh, an ESB, Fuller's ESB, this is far too malty. And again, what we're trying to do with putting these beers into the different categories is to give them the best opportunity to win that category. So if this is up against ESB, the characteristics are completely different. That roasty character, it means it's not a premium bitter. So now you're deciding on which of these uh, beers, which of this, these beer styles in category seven is it? And I would ask that you have a look at the flow charts, which will definitely help you decide on where it should go. So when we're looking at the browns and red ales, old ales or strong milds, read through those different characteristics. Now, the reason for bringing this category together is because this was another area of growth. We're seeing a lot more uh, brown ales coming through, a lot more, uh, a lot more red ales, both American using American hops, American browns, American reds. But we didn't want to lose the old ales and strong malt. There aren't a huge number of them, 
The old owls tend to be quite fruity, but darker in sort of colour. And uh, the and strong mild, we're not looking at much. We're not looking at much fruit. The roast character is is the is the main dominant flavour on these. But we didn't want to lose these. So I'm going to ask you now to have a look and and come back and think about what style do you think it is? What style out of these four? Just using those characteristics. Is it a brown ale? Is it a red ale? Is it an old ale? Or is it a strong mild? So have a look, have a good, have a good taste, use the four characteristics in terms of what it looks like, what it smells like, what it tastes like, what it, and the aftertaste to see where you think that beer is coming from. Once you've done it, you'll come back and we'll have a chat about that beer. Okay, well, welcome back again. Let's go through the four different I, I, beers it could be, the beer styles it could be. And one of the reasons too for combining all these beers into one, in one category is that it allows a lot more fluidity between the different beer styles because as you probably see, it's not that easy to decide on where this beer should sit. So let's start with a strong mild. It's not a strong mild, it shouldn't have those estuary characters, that really sort of fruity, caramelised fruit, that sort of strong on the nose that, that that's really present in this that shouldn't be there in a strong mild think about the roasted characteristics of a strong mild should be very much more roasted sort of lead and the strong mild is it's four percent and above but definitely not this sort of beer could be an old ale but i would expect for a good quality uh, old ale this is probably a bit on the pale side if you look at the color it's quite pale that doesn't mean to say it can't be but I would expect for an old ale to be a have more roasted sort of characters, a bit of chocolate, a bit of uh, uh, a bit of coffee. When you taste this, not getting that sort of characteristic. For me, I'm getting more toffee, more caramel than I am about the dark roasted sort of character. I'm also getting nuttiness, which again is from the crystal malt, which I mentioned earlier. But I'm not getting that roasted character that I really would expect of a really good uh, old ale. So that comes back to, is it a brown ale or is it a red ale? Those very similar sort of characteristics. When you think of a brown ale, I would think of things like Newcastle Brown. Again, that's sort of brown sort of characteristics, sweetish. This is reasonably sweet. It can be, have those sort of fruity characters, particularly if it's an American brown. But for me, I think it comes down to just on the verge of being a red. It's slightly on the redder side, um, and I would agree with what uh, what this beer is called, which is ruby, and I think this is a ruby ale, so it's a red ale. The sorts of ruby ales that are around, I'll give you a couple of examples, are things like uh, uh, a tiny rebel kutch, uh, that, they describe that as a Welsh red ale, definitely a, a red ale. Or, or Red McGregor, uh, which again is a, a Scottish beer, and there's lots of, that's a really nice beer if you want to have an example of that. If you want to try and find what an old ale is like, go onto Camera's website and look at the past winners for the old ale categories, things like uh, Old Dairy Snowtop, and then when we're talking about the strong miles, the strong mile that everyone can name, uh, there's a regular beer drinker, is uh, Sarah Hughes Dark Ruby Mild. So that gives you a really, that's a really, really good example of a well, of award-winning uh, dark mild. So by all means, go and have a look at the, what the categories are so you can get your head around that, okay? So we're gonna come on to the last beer. What I'd like you to do, which is, uh, is to clean your palate again, then build up the flavors on this, make sure it's quite clean, get your stout or porter out, and then we're gonna get back together again and have a chat, okay. Now, once again, get your beer poured out and you can have a sip of this while, uh, while I talk about it. The beer I've got is from a London brewery called East London Brewery and it's a quadrant and it's an oat quadrant and it's an oatmeal stout. It's 5.2%, uh, 5.8%, uh, big pardon. And so it'd be sitting in the premium uh, category in terms of stouts and porters. So let me run through about why, what we've done with this category. Currently, we have a stout and a porter category. What we've done is we've combined them together. So let me explain why we've done that. 
and to give a bit more explanations about the differences between porters and spouts. So there is, a, there is confusion between a porter and stout. As far as Kamler's definition is concerned, a porter is hoppy and roasty. So when you pick up a porter, it should smell of fruit and hops. So you're getting that sort of fruity sort of character, but there should be some roast there. With a stout, it's very much more roast. So if you're getting fruit or hops, it's very minimal. A porter too could be either dark brown or black. So you will find that porters on the flow charts are also in the dark brown categories and the brown categories which on that flow charts. At one time, a stout simply meant strong. So you could have a stout porter, could have a stout bitter as well, or a stout mild, it just simply meant strong. And what we've done is we try to define the, those two characteristics. Now there's a lots of conflict between the two. So we're getting a, many stouts these days can be on the fruity side. So they're sitting halfway between the two. So by combining these categories together, it's given us a lot more fluidity between the two beer styles. So that we're saying uh, this is a porterish stout and that gives us the opportunity with this. What we've done is we've split them by alcohol content. And we've looked at what the number of beers on uh, on our brewery information system and we've divided them by two so our session at 4.9 percent and below and the strong are above 4.9 4 so it's five percent and above and simply be split by numbers so we've got half one side and half the other this allows as said much more fluidity between the styles of porters and stouts We've included definitions and you will find this, all of the definitions are on page seven and page eight of the, of the style sheets. And you'll find in terms of the flow charts, it's on page four. And here we're looking at this, we're giving some help in terms of what we would expect from Imperial Stout or Baltic Porter. Didn't do that before. And so that gives you an idea because these are really strong characteristics and they're strong in flavour and they're strong in alcohol content as well. That's what you're looking for in the, those styles. And both ABV categories, i.e. those below 4.9% and above 4.9% include the traditional beer uh, stout styles. Here we're talking about dry stouts. We're talking about oyster stouts. Oyster stouts are really interesting because oysters, the oyster stout can have oysters in or it doesn't necessarily have to. So for example, Adnam's oyster stout doesn't have any oysters in. It, uh, it, it's just a beer that's been designed to be drunk with, with oysters, but you can end up with beers with both the flesh of the oyster and or the shells. So sometimes it's with it, sometimes it's not, but hence the reason we put all the oyster stouts into this category because it's too confusing for people. Oatmeal stouts, I've got an oatmeal stout. It's designed to give a richer mouthfeel. Uh, it gives a smoothness to the beer and compensates for some of that dryness that you can pick up on a, on a, on a dry stout. They're milk stouts. These are beers that had lactose added. They give you vanilla notes, a creaminess on the palate. Probably our best well-known milk stout is Mackeson. It's 2.8% in the UK. Abroad, you can find it at 6% or above. So here's a quick run through of what we're expecting when it comes to, uh, to stouts and porters. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to have a look at those, those different characteristics. Think about, is it a premium or is it a, is it a, sorry, a strong or is, it, or is it a session uh, porter or stout that you've got? Have a look at the black beers or if it's a brown beer, it's probably going to go, it may well go into the porter categories. Have a look at it and then think using that template where I was looking about the appearance, the aroma, the taste and the aftertaste. Is it a good example of what it reports to be? So if you've got a milk stout, is it a good milk stout? Is it, if it's a, an ordinary stout, a strong stout, is it a good example of that? Is it a porter? Does, that, is it, does it have that fruity, hoppy nose? Is it a good example? So have a taste of it and then when you're ready, come back and we'll round up. Well, for those of you who have got the West Indian uh, uh, porter or the Guinness Nigerian, I suspect there's a nice warm glow going on there. My 5.8 is, is going on that way. So it, mine's a bottle of condition beer, uh, but a lovely ruby, dark ruby, brown, black cut sort of character. Lots of oatmeal. I love this beer. So 
you've got an idea now. We've run through the five different beers. We started off with uh, with the speciality. We then went on to the pales, which go, uh, and then the golden, uh, the IPA, the West Indian. Then we did a brown beer, well, a ruby red brown beer, and then we finished off with a dark beer. Pick this, these five beers because they're all different styles. So let's just do a round up of what we're actually expecting in terms of those different styles. So we've covered the mild. You can see we've covered the session and, and premium bitters. The IPAs we've covered, we've covered the session pails and the, and the premium pails, blondes, gold nails, and give you an explanation of why we've done that. The red ales, brown ales, old ales, and strong ales, you can start to see how difficult it can be sometimes to, to decide on where that beer should be. We've covered the session stouts and porters and the strong porters and stouts, barley wines and strong ales we've touched on, and last but not least, the speciality differently produced and, and flavoured. So you can see we've covered all of those 12 different, different beer styles. And now what we've got to do is we've got, we're, we're in the process at this moment in time of putting those beers into different categories. What we can say is those categories will change. The last time we did any big change for our beer styles until now was back in 2005 when we introduced the gold nail category. We did some tweaks in 2008. So it's been 12 years since we've last looked at these beer categories uh, and the beer styles within that. We don't want to leave it so long. We know that brewery is becoming more and more experimental and a lot of them are pushing the boundaries back between some of these styles. So we have to take into account of that as we move forward. So we will be continually looking at how we're defining some of these styles as we go, uh, as we go through the next few years. And uh, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is enjoy drinking. Thank you very much for your attention. If you need to get a hold of me or you've got questions, by all means, drop me an email. My, uh, my email is christine.crine, that's C-R-Y-N-E, at gmail.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And by all means, have a look at Camera's website uh, about training courses that we're doing both online and physical. So cheers and enjoy your beer.